We're probably, yeah. we're just about to let people into our Zoom event. Um, they may be seeing me from the chest down, which is completely <laughs> fine by me. Um, <laughs> so if you are joining us on Zoom, welcome. Yes, they are joining us. And I do have a head, but I'm standing too close to the camera, um, which I won't adjust because it's in the perfect place for our event tonight. Um, so just a couple of bits and pieces before I actually start the event. One of them is for the people in the room here. While you're um, drinking your wine, it's completely fine that you don't have your mask on, but we do ask that when you finish drinking your wine and if you enter the bookshop at any time that you put your mask back on. Um, so uh, I think that this morning they said the masks are the reason we are not in the position that the other states are in, and I think that's a really great thing. So um, we're going to stick by the rules. Um, the other thing is that for the people in the room, there are a set of toilets upstairs. If you go um, to the counter, there's a sign that says don't use the toilets, but it's completely fine for the people who are here for our event tonight to use the toilets. So up the stairs and to the right along the corridor, and that is where the toilet is. Uh, and also the book of the moment, which I can show to the camera, um, is front and centre at the counter. And after this event tonight, we're going to um, move through, um, but we're going to let um, James go through first so he can get to the table for signing. Um, and that's where the, the book is if you want to um, go and grab one and get it signed or just to chat to James, it's completely fine too. Okay, and so for those people on Zoom as well, um, you'll be on silent for the duration of the event, but you can ask questions. If you type them at any time into the chat bar, they will get texted to me out here. So I will be able to ask them for you at the end of the event. So feel free to do that. And also um, my assistant Louis is gonna be sending you through a link um, to the book of the moment. And that link um, will also be in the chat area. So if you aren't familiar with Zoom, that will be where you put your questions in that chat area where the link is. That should be coming to you very soon. Okay, um, also for the people in the room, if you can put your phones to silent, that'd be great as well. Fantastic. So with that, I'll start the event and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area, the Yagra and the Turrbal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to um, all uh, other areas of Australia that we're zooming out onto. I'd like to acknowledge the elders of the land on which you are meeting us as well. And to acknowledge um, that this is Aboriginal land and always was and always will be. Sovereignty was never ceded. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our guests tonight. Of course, we're here to listen to James Fitzgerald, who, um, who is the author of the moment. He's a manager direct, managing director of the JLF group of companies that has bought and sold more than 2,000 blocks of land in just 10 years. He is also chairman of Tugulawa Schools Limited, a not-for-profit school for boys who are no longer able to attend mainstream schools. James is 31 and lives in Brisbane with his wife, Hannah. He is a keen AFL player and supports St Kilda. He holds a bachelor's degree in law and commerce, majoring in accounting. So everybody welcome James Fitzgerald. Thank you. And in conversation with James tonight, we have Georgina Lewis, who is well known to Queenslanders for her 13 years as anchor of 10, 10's News at Five. Georgie started her career as a reporter in Queensland's remote northwest and moved into television anchoring Channel 10's regional news bulletin before making the move to Brisbane in 1999. Over her 25 years in television, Georgie became adept in live breaking news coverage. Hopefully we won't have anything <laughs> go on tonight. But if we do, you heard it here first. <laughs> she is often called upon to MC major events like this one and was a natural choice to host um, this conversation with James Fitzgerald. So please welcome Georgie. Thank you, Chrissy, And thank you, James, for joining us here this evening. Obviously, you are the man of the moment with the book of the moment. I guess uh, we want to start with how did this book come about? It's quite a process, isn't it? Uh, did you ever think that you'd write a book? Uh, it, was, it was a big process, uh, and the, the short answer is no. I definitely didn't think I would ever write a book. Um, and I guess the, the origins of it was uh, around just over 12 months ago, I was sitting down with uh, my uncle, who uh, I work for, and he's a bit of a mentor of mine, an author in his own right. And we were enjoying, uh, as, as uh, most Australians were last year, 
the freedoms eventually of not having so much going on in our lives. Uh, we used to travel once a week and uh, we weren't doing that anymore. And so we're sitting down, we catch up every Thursday, have a cup of coffee, and just talk about life. And uh, he said to me, this was in May, he said, James, you should write a book. And uh, I sort of just brushed it aside. I said, yep, good one. Uh, Matt, I'm not going to write a book. I'm 30 years old. I don't know what I'd write about. And I sure, sure know that no one's going to read it if I do. He said, oh, well, you know, who knows? You, you know, you might be surprised. Uh, why don't you mind map it and just see what happens? And so uh, for those not familiar with mind mapping it, it basically means you, you put an A3 piece of paper down and you just start putting thought bubbles all over the paper. And I, I've used it before with, with success. Uh, so I started doing that and, and my wife, Hannah, who's here, she would remember there was A3 bits of paper all over the, the office study. It caught on a little bit. And, um, and then it was pretty much from that point that I went off the plan. So the plan was to do a mind map and then sit down with John and start to put a PowerPoint together of some chapters and some topics and some themes, some stories, all this great stuff that probably is the perfect way to write a book. Uh, but I just got to a point where the words were just starting to really flow. Uh, there was bubbles everywhere. And I just started writing, pulled out the laptop and just started. And, uh, and I think within a month I had about 30,000 words. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe I could write a book. Uh, so no, I definitely think I would write a book. And I have to admit, even when I got to 30,000 books, uh, 30,000 words, uh, I still thought it was going to be a book that sat in my basement for the rest of my life and that was about it. But here we are today and you've obviously been on ABC Breakfast, which is a big, uh, obviously a big national coup for you to get on and have your book uh, spoken about there as well. Let's um, delve a little deeper into your family situation, how that shaped who you are today. Who is James Fitzgerald? Who's James Fitzgerald? Um, really smart, um, good, no, 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 I grew up on the Gold Coast. That's where I was born and raised. My mum is from Sydney. Dad was from Melbourne. Um, they moved up to Brisbane, is where they met, in Coobaroo, uh, not too far from, uh, from here. And, um, and I, I was born just over the border, got three sisters, grew up on the Gold Coast, massive AFL fan, loved sport. You know, going through school, it was all about sport for me. I, went, I was lucky I went to a good school that, that really uh, pushed hard on academics uh, and they had to push me a little bit harder to, to fall in line on that. Uh, but I did and, um, and, and did okay through school but was more into the sport. Uh, finished school and decided that I would go to university, uh, not for any other reason than that I didn't want to work. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and sort of have fun. It looks like fun on those movies, <laughs> university. So I went off and, uh, and I thought, oh, what am I going to study? I thought, oh, I really like those law shows. So maybe I'll see if I could be a lawyer. Uh, so I just studied law. And uh, I got about halfway through that degree and I thought, I do like it, but I don't seem to be very good at it. according <laughs> to my grades. <laughs> so I thought, oh, um, more, what I might do is I might throw accounting in the mix because I was much more of a numbers person um, growing up. And so I, I threw, threw in, uh, the accounting in, ended up finishing and uh, going off and studying law, uh, sorry, um, working in, in the law. Uh, and then fortuitously, I was sort of, you know, probably not loving it and realising I wasn't that good at it uh, and ended up doing two weeks work experience with my uncle, who's got a business uh, that, that's been going for some time. And I never left. 11 years later, I'm, I'm still there. Uh, after so a couple of weeks. before the word became famous, well, uh, you know, in this last year, you pivoted back then into something else. Yeah, uh, and, years and ago, from law to accounting, and correct. And my mum's in the crowd. I reckon she was probably really nervous when I left the very steady um, uh, line of work and career path in law to go off and join my property development investing uncle who throws caution to the wind. So I think at the time, I'm sure she's happy now. But I think at the time she was very nervous, although she wouldn't have told me to my face. Let's um, talk a bit about your family life then and how that shaped where you wanted to go with this book. Sure. So in my mind maps, the three pages that were strewn, uh, strewn all over my study, there was one thing that was a core um, element. It was sort of front and centre 
and had many different bubbles on those pages. And that was about 12 months prior to this point uh, in May last year, uh, going back to March 2019. I, I had a, a, a very um, traumatic experience. I got a knock on the, the door. I was staying with my dad down in Melbourne and uh, got a knock on the door one a Sunday morning at 4.30 a.m. from the police to say, uh, James, I'm sorry, your dad's been hit by a train, he's dead. 59 years old and it just it, it flattened me shattered me floored me all those things he was my best mate we spoke every single day for half an hour every single day and only eight hours before that I'd left him at a bar and it just completely knocked the wind out of me and and, and there'll be people uh, watching maybe in the audience who've gone through grief uh, trauma like that and they can probably relate that you get to a point and it's not at the start, but at the start, you're trying to rationalise it and understand it and put a reason to understand why it happened. But at some point, you hopefully get to a stage where you just accept it. And in fact, you accept that you don't know why it happened and you, you're at peace to not know. It was just part of the plan. Uh, and I got to that point, but what was still going on in my mind was learning in the aftermath uh, a lot of the things that were going on in dad's life, which I didn't know about, and which whilst they didn't cause dad's death, they contributed to it and certainly didn't help it. And that was that for the last 30 years of dad's life, he had suffered terrible anxiety over money to the point where for the last 30 years, he'd taken two sleeping tablets every single night just to get to sleep because he was worried about money uh, he, he was worried about what other people felt about whether he did or didn't have money. And the great irony of that, as I was reflecting, is that the man had 300 people at his funeral who flew from all over the world and not one of them could have given two bobs as to whether he did or didn't have money. It was so unimportant in the grand scheme of things and yet he placed so much importance on it. And so ultimately that, that became you know, a reason, I guess, for writing the book uh, and, and I guess became the mission of Bulletproof Investing. So you really uh, obviously wanted to uh, talk to people about gaining control of their financial situation. Uh, you're comfortable talking about, you know, your childhood. Take us through, once you delve deeper into reflecting back on your father throughout that, you know, that time frame, um, you realised... Probably the stuff that I think kids aren't aware of what goes on, really. They just accept life and this is that and mum and dad might be having an argument in the kitchen over something, usually money-related, mm. um, but you didn't realise the extent of all of that um, yeah. with their financial situation as you were growing up. Just take us through that. Yeah, so I think, I think first of all, you know, it was one thing for me to, to have this realisation that dad had this big problem. But then what I sort of, where the bubbles took me, so to speak, in the mind map, is, is this common? Is this unusual? And what I found out is that it's not at all. It's, uh, it's in fact, very, very common. Uh, one in two Australians battle mental health. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges that our country, in fact, the world faces today. And the biggest one is anxiety. 13% of all Australians suffer anxiety. And the numbers just go on and on and on with the link between finance. Uh, and half of, half of people that do experience mental illness don't seek help. And that includes anxiety. And so I thought, well, how can I, how can I reach the people that don't seek the help? And that involved, or, or that's probably where I just started writing. You know, I talked about I went off, off the course of the plan. I just started writing and I thought, I'm just going to put my stories down. I'm going to put the story of, of dad's story. I'm going to try and understand how it got to that point as well. And that involved ripping the Band-Aid off. In fact, ripping multiple Band-Aids off. And I remember mum came over for like six hours one, one uh, Sunday afternoon and just talked to me about everything that had happened. And there was so much stuff I didn't know. Like when I was five years old, uh, mum and dad had three kids under five and dad um, built up a gambling habit to the point where he owed bookies $160,000. Our home was worth like $200,000 at the time. So it's, it's just huge. Uh, now they, they, they ended up, you know, getting back on their feet. Um, but that was a major setback early on. 
And the irony was I never spoke to dad about that. He lived for 59 years. I was 30 at the time. He never said a single word to me about the gambling. And yet I've had a couple of mates who've had real big struggles with it, which we would have talked about, you know, once, twice a week. So there's just this sort of, I guess, uh, shame, maybe, shame. Um, and in many ways, I think, you know, some of that stuff about ripping the Band-Aid off, sharing those stories where mum and dad had control at various points but would sort of fall out of control. And I wanted to share all, all of those stories. And then eventually where I landed was my own experience with anxiety because I'm no different. I, I don't think there's anyone in Australia, maybe even the world, who could sit down and say, I've never had anxiety over money. Like it's just, I don't think it's a thing. And my, my biggest anxiety trigger was I got halfway through that law degree and I realised that it probably, ne I probably needed a backup. So I said to Dad, I said, um, Dad, I'm thinking about taking on accounting. What do you think? And my dad's like, he was the supreme optimist. Like there was nothing that couldn't be done and nothing was a bad idea. James, great idea. You should absolutely do that. Cool. Okay. Um, can we afford it? Like I think it's going to cost a bit more money and it won't be covered by the government. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll, don't worry about that. You will be fine. If you want to do it, go and do it. Great. Off I go. So maybe um, 12 months later, I get the bill once the government help had run out. It was $12,000. And as a 20-year-old, I have to admit, somewhat ashamedly right now, I had no idea how much $12,000 was. Like in the grand scheme of things, it's just a bunch of numbers for me. Uh, I wasn't used to the real world. So I took the bill to Dad and I said, uh, Dad, here's the bill for the, for the uni fees. Can you sort it out? <laughs> and, uh, and he just sort of said to me, he said, mate, I don't have the money. And I was like, what? What do you mean you don't have the money? You told me to go and do it. And this is naive. I, I realise how naive in hindsight it, it sounds, but that's just how I was raised. I think mum and dad had their reasons to shelter kids and, and, and most parents do. They shelter kids from the numbers and the money because they don't want them to worry about it and, and it probably doesn't feel like it's relevant. So I just was sheltered from that. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't have a grasp of the fact that that was my $12,000 bill. It wasn't my dad's $12,000 bill. Now, uh, we ended up solving that. We went and got a loan uh, from a bank. The loan had an interest rate of 11% per annum. It accumulated over three years. And I had to pay it back within uh, three years of being in the workforce. So a $40,000 loan accruing 11% had to be paid back within two or three years. And that's on top of the 100000 I borrowed from the government, albeit at a lower rate. <laughs> so when I started working, uh, I can't remember, you know, maybe I was earning $60,000 a year. Uh, I had no idea if that was enough. <laughs> like, I just, I, I woke up with terrible anxiety, uh, just having no idea how much life cost and whether I had enough and, and just where the money was going. I just, I was out of control. That was my own experience with it. So I share all those stories and that's where the, the, you know, the start of the writing got me. And then, and then I tried to steer it from there as, you know, in terms of, well, how can I then help give people the knowledge, skills and tools that might be able to help them get control and then importantly, keep control, which I think is almost hard. Yeah, well, you obviously had that pivotal moment and then you ended up working for your uncle, um, John. How important is it to have that mentor? Yep. You take us through that. Well, it might be the most important thing. I mean, you know, there's there's uh, there's 12 bulletproof tips in the book, and I'm not going to say that one's more important than other uh, than another. But one of them is finding a mentor, and you know, for me, that was uh, that was uh, an important, um, I guess, juncture that I arrived at, where uh, what he was able to 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 help me understand is that your financial standing or otherwise in life, whether or not you experience the mental freedom that comes from being in control of your money has nothing to do with how much money you earn. And that was something going through school and university that I had a misplaced uh, preconception on. I thought you didn't worry about money if you weren't a certain amount of money. Whereas what he taught me very early on is that it has very little to do with that it's about what you do with the money. And, and it's about this concept of working smarter, not harder. 
And that, to me, was a very, very foreign concept uh, going back 11 years. But that's, that's what a mentor teaches you. They have the wisdom experience to be able to teach you a way to look at life and look at things that, that's different to the way that you might have been brought up to see it or the way that you've learnt to see it. Uh, and I don't know how you do that without a mentor. So when did you realise then, obviously your uncle was in property, um, that property was the way to go? He gave you a good steering, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, I, I didn't. I knew, so for, that, for those unfamiliar, John, John, my uncle, has got a book, Seven Steps to Wealth. It's like the best uh, selling property book, uh, you know, around. Eighth edition, 250,000, you know, like it's a very well-known book. Uh, he himself, self-made millionaire by 25, um, multi-multi-millionaire, very, very much a Midas touch kind of guy. I didn't actually know any of that when I started working for him. All I knew is that he had this big house that was like Disneyland. It had a gym, a pool, a tennis court, um, like a bigger, bigger, you know, guest room than, 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 than master room, five times the size of any house that I'd seen growing up. I just knew that he probably had a lot of money and that was, that was about it. Uh, when I started sort of working for him, I learned a little bit about how he'd done it. And, um, and to be honest with you, although he taught me how to do, how to gain control with money, and then how to, uh, you know, invest and ultimately retain that control. Um, I would say the knowledge he taught me about property was secondary to the knowledge he taught me about the relationship that we should have with money and, and also, you know, the, the mindset that we, we should have. You know, I don't, I don't think that you just need to, you could probably make money or, or invest your money in various different ways and do well out of it. I think the habits and the mindset and the relationship that you form with money is more important. And I think that's probably what he taught me, um, which, which was slightly more valuable than how to, you know, make money out of a particular type of asset or, or, or property specifically. It was that relationship and mindset. Yeah, because you talk about budgeting in your book, don't you? And when do you when do you believe people should sort of wise up and start getting that budget under control? Well, as soon as possible. I mean, you know, the, the young the youngest the younger you can do it, the better. Um, however, I think you know you're going to do it when when the universe thinks you're ready to do it, and that doesn't that's not something that you you, you know I say because you know I encourage people to have any form of spiritual belief. I just think. Some people just aren't ready. You're ready when, when, when you're ready. Uh, and that could be, you know, introduced to you by picking up a book. Uh, and that, that's certainly what, you know, I hope that Bulletproof Investing would do. It could be having a, a chat with someone. It could be that you're totally out of control. You hit rock bottom and you have no other choice than to try and get back control. Uh, the younger, the better, for sure. Um, but, but I think, you know, first of all, um, you know, when it comes to getting started, you know, it can be overwhelming. So you've just got to remember that, you know, baby steps and uh, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to learn it all in one go. You've just got to start somewhere and take it one step at a time. Uh, and ultimately, you know, just try and, and find a way that engages you. Well, tell us about that first property that you bought. What did you buy? What was it like? How much did it cost you? Yeah, so, okay, so what, what, in fact, what, I, what I'll say, just to, to round out on John, John has no idea how to budget. Like, John <laughs> wouldn't be able to spell budget. Um, he's got people that he pays to budget for him. Um, so I actually couldn't learn that off him. I had to almost self-teach that, and, and I picked up a, a book uh, called The Richest Man in Babylon, which was written in 1930. You know, what, what's, what's the saying? Uh, the, there's seven original ideas in the world. Um, that out of nowhere, <laughs> but um, you know, there's, there's a lot of great information that's been around for a long time. A book written in 1930, I still think it's the best book you could ever read on budgeting, and it 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 shifted my mindset to start by saying, pay yourself first. Uh, I've been taught through school and through accounting that you figure out what you earn, you figure out what it costs to live, and then if there's something left over, you try and save it. Whereas The Richest Man in Babylon, this book written in 1930, said, no, 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 you figure out how much you earn, then you figure out how much you want to save, and then you live off the difference. And that to me was like, oh, yeah, 
that's kind of obvious, but I didn't even pick that up through an accounting degree. You know, like that, the, the great irony, I get it once it's explained in that way, but, but it's ironic. Um, and I was going along that path of saving and, um, and John pulled me aside. And uh, the thing about John and the thing about, I think, successful people um, is that they, they often, you know, think that you can do things that you don't think are possible. And that's probably their mindset as a successful person. John thought I could write a book before I could write a book, before I thought I could write a book. Uh, John said to me uh, at one point, I was very proudly telling him how much I was saving. And he said, that's great, James, but you're saving, you know, $10,000 a year, you know, which is great, but how long is it going to take you to get to the point where, you know, you could buy a house and, and that sort of thing? And it was years. He said, I'm going to suggest that you go and buy a property. And I think I'd saved $20,000 at the time. And I was like, are you kidding? Like a property? A property costs, <laughs> I'm flat out paying off this, this student loan. Yeah. I'm flat out saving my 100 bucks a week. Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, and, and for me, that was, that was him sort of putting me in the deep end to learn what it was to work smarter, not harder. He said, James, no one starts with money. You've got to start by using someone else's money. I was like, oh, okay, you can do that? He said, yeah. He said, I used someone else's money. I used the bank's money from time to time. I used a, a, a wealthy um, mentor's money to get started in my own career. He said, there's always someone, if you're willing to ask enough people, there'll be someone who's willing to help you get started. They might charge you for it, but hey, Half of one's better than all of none. So I, I sort of took me probably three months to wrap my head around that because I'm conservative. I'm, I'm like really conservative. Lawyer, accountant, other than an engineer, it probably doesn't get more conservative than that. And I just couldn't wrap my head around debt. I couldn't wrap my head around uh, so many things. But most importantly, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that I couldn't afford to buy in the place that I would want to live. And so John had to teach me that you sort of got to take the emotion out of it when it comes to investing, whether that's property or, or anything. Um, and, and that was that was a process that uh, was very hard for me to, to wrap my head around. I eventually got there. John ended up giving me a head start. I borrowed maybe 90% from the bank. Uh, I got the first homeowner's grant, which gave me circa 5%. And then John loaned me the other 5%. So I put in no money he fronted me my deposit. Uh, I had to take the loan out. And what he, what he did for me, though, is he said, I'm going to make sure that you don't lose money. So what I'm going to do is rather than charge you interest on the money, I'm going to charge you 25% of whatever the property go goes up in value by. So I'm going to lend you the 5%, but I want 25% of whatever that property grows in value by. And whenever you pay me back, that 25% stops accumulating and, and we'll call it a day. And he said, and I want you to learn that even though we're family, I want to have an agreement on it because I want it, I want it to be, you know, something that's, that's treated as a, a business transaction and you take ownership for all the details. And it was the best thing he's ever done. Like it wasn't a free ride. Sure, he gave me a hand and I'm ever, ever so grateful that he gave me a hand. It wasn't a free ride though. And, uh, and ultimately... I paid him back his 5% um, in three, or three years later. It's in the book. I think three or four years later. And I think I gave him a return of 30% on his money or 40% on his money. So he did probably a lot better than what uh, I would have done if I borrowed it from a cheaper alternative. But I, it gave me the peace of mind to start because he said, I'm not going to make money unless you do. And I think that is a great way for anyone who's going to help out um, you know, their own kids, uh, a friend or family member, try and, um, you know, give them that head start by taking a bit of the risk with them if you can. Okay, so back to that question because you avoided the whole answer. Um, what was the first house? Where'd you buy it? Which so it's in Ipswich. Uh, first time owners grant is um, something that you, you can get if you live in it. So I had to go out to Ipswich for six months. I was living in uh, in Leafy, Bolimba at the time. So it was a bit of a change. Um, so is it also about making sacrifices then? 
Yeah, I don't you know, don't have to live in the perfect house as, the first time, as you go time, do you? You just build up. No, no, and and you know, I, th I think you, you've got to, ultimately no one's. Some people maybe they can. I couldn't, and I was desperate to get ahead. I was desperate to start building wealth and and getting to a point or starting on my journey to not worrying about money. That was my my real you know, goal and aspiration was to get to a point in life where I never have to worry about money again. So I was deeply motivated to do that. And therefore the sacrifice to move out somewhere for six months, uh, even if it was, you know, 35, 40 minutes um, from where I worked in the Valley at the time, uh, it was worth it for me. The government gave me $10,000 as a, as a kickstart, free money that you've never got to pay back. Like how good? Um, it's even more these days the, the rules have sort of changed. Um, and, and yeah, I, I took out, I borrowed the rest and it was in an area with um, high population growth, 700 square metre block, four bedroom home. I think I bought it for about $300,000. So it was cheap. Um, it was within my price range. And ultimately after I uh, moved back to Brisbane after the six months, I was able to rent it out for a rental amount that covered my mortgage. So it did all the things that if you divorce yourself from the emotion, it did all the things that it needed to do. It needed to pay for itself. It needed to be land in a high growth area, which John taught me was ultimately what will grow in value. Um, didn't have trendy cafes, didn't have nice Italian restaurants, <laughs> didn't have all the things that maybe I would want to form a buying decision based Where on. Where you'd spend all your money. <laughs> Correct, where I'd spend all that money that I'd save. Yeah, so, I don't know, Georgie, did I answer at that time? Or you did, did I dodge you did. Again? Well done. <laughs> You're off the hook. Okay, because we, uh, we have about 15 minutes left before we can do the Q&A, so I want to get a few more questions in with you. Um, let's give the audience some of those tips. I know you do have a top 10 tips, but maybe let's make a concise five. Yep. Um, you've obviously already talked about one of them. Yes. Um, so maybe let's do four, because I do want okay. to get on to the law school and all that sure. stuff as well. So give us your top four. So there is 12 tips in, in the book. Um, they're roughly, I think they're roughly split in half. I, I should know this, but I think there's roughly six in the first part of the book, which is sort of before you get started. And that's about getting control. Um, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that there's any uh, more important than the others, but I will say there's two in that section that are my favourite. Uh, the first one is going cashless. Avoid it. I don't go cash. I draw out cash every single week. I take out $200. I've been doing that since I was 20 years old because I like to see it go. And if it goes too quick, then that's on me. So uh, my uncle, my other uncle actually taught me that one. Uh, I was living with him when I moved up to Brisbane. And that was to draw out the cash so that you don't lose track of all the little expenses that you, you pay on tap and go and, and all that sort of thing. Very hard to do. 92% of all transactions today are cashless. Because COVID threw a spanner in the works with that, didn't it? And COVID threw a spanner in the works. I was still able to draw out cash, albeit it was slightly frowned upon. Um, <laughs> but no, I thought I'm going to stick to my guns here. I just used the antibacterial cream before I got <laughs> uh, But yeah, going cashless, I, um, I, I'm really anti that. I say cash is king. And, uh, and I always draw out the 200 bucks every single week. If I, I draw it out on Friday before the weekend and I do that tactically because I don't want to blow it all by the end of the weekend, otherwise I've got to have the Makona or the Blend 43 throughout the week uh, that the office provides or I've got to, uh, you know, lean on some friends for maybe some tuna and, uh, and salad for, for, for lunch. So... Um, know all about that. <laughs> know all about that. <laughs> so that's, that's my favourite one uh, or one of my favourites. And, uh, and the other one I love is, is find, find your why. Uh, and John, I was 20 years old when I started working for John. I went from lawyer to John's PA. So that was the, the career path. Um, and it was the best learning ground you'd, you'd ever have, learning from someone day to day who, who is successful. And he pulled me in when I just started working for him. And he said, James, what do you want? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I'm 20 years old. I want to finish my degree and have fun, uh, play a footy on the weekend. Like, isn't that what everyone wants? He said, James, look, I see a lot of people go through life and they sort of meander. 
He said, I encourage you, if you can, at some point, it doesn't have to be now, but I encourage you to try and pick a goal and pick a, pick a, a real purpose and a real big goal that you can, you can strive for that will give you purpose as you move through life. So I went away and I thought, you know what, I'm going to come up with that straight away. So I went away and I thought, what would John want to hear? What would John want to hear? And I went back and I said, John, I've got it. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be a millionaire. He said, uh, James, that's terrible. He said, no, no, that is not a goal. I can't feel that. It means nothing. What does being a millionaire mean? It means nothing. Being rich, how does anyone benefit from that? I was like, oh, Okay. He said, I want you to go back and think about something bigger, something that when life gets a little bit hard, it's going to be enough to keep you motivated to maintain the momentum and go through and keep going on. I was like, oh, okay, all right. He said, maybe it's easier for you to answer the question a different way rather than what do you want, what don't you want? And so I went away and I thought, you know what, uh, where I landed eventually was mum and dad gave us kids everything that we could ever want great schools, all the sporting, extracurricular, holidays, everything. But I knew that there was always a level of angst and worry about money. And I thought, I wonder if it's possible to still do all those things but not worry about money. Is that a thing? So I went back to John and I said, look, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking maybe I'd like to do all these things in life but do them in a way where I don't worry about money. Is that doable? He said, James, that I can feel. He said, that I can feel because that's going to benefit you, your family, others, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so that for me, and there was others about, you know, barbecues and pools and houses and, and other more material things. Uh, and they're important too. But, you know, really figuring out your why. Why are you going to do the hard yards to get control and try and keep it? Um, that is probably the second one that's my favourite in that first bit. Tell me if I've gone too long. The, the last, uh, the last, um, the last, part of the book, the second part, they're more around the knowledge, skills and tools. And the first one that, uh, that John has professed upon me, which I think is the most important for the younger generation today, and that is to invest in something that will grow in value and grow in value in a way that you understand it. Now, for me, that was land, but I don't profess that everyone should invest in property. All I say and, and sort of advocate for is investing in something that's going to grow in value and you understand why it's going to grow in value. You know, I don't understand, despite many people who've made a lot of money out of Bitcoin, I still don't understand how it grows in value. No. <laughs> so it's not for me, but I understand land, they're not making any more of it. And as the population grows around capital cities, it becomes more valuable and I can understand it. And so I, I encourage anyone who is going to invest and try and, you know, make their money work for them, understand that, one, it's going to grow in value and understand the base elements of why. You don't have to be an expert, but understand the base elements of it. And then the second one is um, compound growth, which is a really, really hard term for most people to wrap their head around. And I did, uh, I did it in math. I did it in accounting. I understood the concept but I had no idea how important it was in real life. But it's so important. It's the most, it's the secret source, I call it, in the book. Um, and that is the ability to repeat uh, the process over and over again. Invest, protect your cash flow, but then repeat it over and over again. Show me someone who is successful with their money or in life. Even, you know, the Olympics are on at the moment. Ariana Tipnis, uh, she is a, a success story around compound growth. Every single day, repeating over and over again, finding compound improvements on her performance every single day. Now, it sounds simple, but it's not, and, and, and it is pretty simple, but it's not easy. Most people don't do it. Most people get to one, one, two, three, give up. And that doesn't matter whether it's investing in property, whether it's workouts, whether it's, um, you know, uh, any, anything that you commit yourself to, you've got to be in it for the long game and you've got to want to get compound improvement. Okay, two more questions, Chrissy, before I hand back over to you. Um, is there a good or bad time to invest? Okay, so there, yes, there's a good time to invest. Now, the best time to invest was in the 80s. 
Oh, that's gone. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> the next best time to invest was yesterday. Uh, so, you know, the, the, unfortunately, you know, it's human nature. For me included, I'm not saying I'm, I'm no different, but we procrastinate. We can't help it. It's just human nature. It's always, you know, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, so, look, you know, the bad time to invest is in a week. The good time to invest is tomorrow. Um, you know, and, and I think the sooner you start, you know, the better it is. It's all about taking that first step. You don't have to bite it all off in one go. Uh, and, you know, John's got this fantastic saying, which I love and which I always use, which is, you know, the journey of a thousand, step, a thousand miles starts with the first step. And if you're climbing a mountain, we've all, we've all climbed mountains, I'm sure, you start and you, you make that first step and you just focus on a few steps. But then as you get up the mountain, you get a little bit tempted to just take stock and look around and see how far you've come. And you might also look at how far there is to go. But you can't stay there for very long. You've got to try and keep going and keep going one step at a time and just take that one step as quickly and, and as often as you can. And so the best time or the good time is as soon as possible. The bad time is in a week. Okay, final question for you. The profits from this book are going towards the Tukuluwa School and also the Financial Basics Foundation. None of this is going in your pocket. Tell us why it's so important for you for those profits to go to those two um, organisations. Yeah, so I think, first of all, I started writing the book because I wanted to prove that I could write a book. Um, I didn't set out to write a book to make money out of it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm already fortunate at 31 years old uh, to be at a point where, you know, Hannah and I, my wife, we don't worry about money and we never will. Um, we've done the things that, that get us to the point where we won't have to. It's not to say we're rich, but, you know, we, we don't worry about money. We've set ourselves up. The book wasn't about making money. I wrote it uh, and, and really ultimately had in mind, I'm writing this book for a 20 to 30 to 40 year old David Fitzgerald uh, to pick up before the anxiety set in. And so the book's uh, intention from day dot, and I didn't know whether I was going to sell five copies, whether it would get published or, or whether it would just sit in the basement and go to some family and friends. Either way, I was okay if it, if it didn't go to many people. I wanted it to help as many people as it, as it was able to do. And so, you know, the proceeds of the book for me, it was almost, always a, a, a thought of, well, where can I send those proceeds to help make a difference? Um, and the Tagulawa School, I chair that board. Uh, it's a school for boys 9 to 15 that don't uh, make it in mainstream school. Uh, and, you know, a third of those, it's because they're on the spectrum in some, uh, in some way uh, with autism. Um, just, don't, just school doesn't work. Um, so that, that to me is a school that's very important to me and, and I get to see firsthand and have a little bit of influence on how that money is spent to make a difference. So half of the proceeds go there and the other half go to the Financial Basics Foundation. And I thought about, you know, a Beyond Blue or one of those types that might be able to help people who are in need. But I realised that prevention is the best medicine. Uh, and the Financial Basics Foundation, I didn't know about them. They were introduced to me. Uh, they are amazing. They're trying to create awareness in schools uh, they've got a bunch of schools and teachers, more importantly, because the teachers are going to drive it, signed up to their financial literacy program, which they run uh, every single year. It's a competition. Uh, and they, they are trying, where, where possible, uh, to get financial literacy as some part of the curriculum is, you know, their big, hairy, audacious goal. I have no input on, on what they, they do with the money. I just think they do a great job. And, um, you know, I think if... if financial literacy can find its way into the school system in any way, even if it's just the way that it's currently being done by the Financial Basics Foundation, it's a great thing. James, thank you for that. We are going to hand over to Chrissy now, who's cool. going to take control of the Q&A by our cool. friends on Zoom and anyone here who might have some questions. I'm going to kick off with a question from Zoom, which has come through already from Terry, um, who has read your book already um, and who would like your thoughts on the impact on property prices, on the fact that we've got the Olympic bid and the Olympics are coming up, mm. um, do we need to kind of think now about um, what is it? Twenty like ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Climate change might have killed us all by then, yeah. and Brisbane <laughs> might be in the water. But if we're not underwater by then, 
What should we do? I think, I think, I mean, how good is, is that news? I mean, how good is it just the fact that we'll be able to see an Olympics, uh, to be able to do that in our lifetime is such a treat. Um, you know, the Olympics is a, uh, it's a global event um, and normally only reserved for, you know, world-class destinations, um, you know, top-tier cities. Brisbane really is a middle-tier city. So what it means ultimately is that Brisbane's going to become a top tier city between now and 2032. Uh, that means that, you know, in addition to hosting 11,000 athletes and support staff, plus all of the spectators COVID permitting in uh, 11 years time, what it's going to mean is that we're going to invest a lot of money, the government is, in growing our infrastructure to be able to cater for that event. Uh, and and um, ultimately it's going to bring a lot of jobs and people to this beautiful city. Um, there is, uh, you know, a bit of a, I guess you, you should, and, and, and I do look back on other Olympics to see what they've done for the property uh, industry. And the Sydney Olympics from 1993 to 2000, when it was announced to when they held it, uh, the Sydney median house price grew by 80%. And in the three years that followed, grew by another 50. So it more than doubled in that 10 year period such was the extent of infrastructure investment, job creation, and ultimately population growth and demand for housing. So um, I don't know if we're going to get that level of growth, but I think it certainly is going to be a good thing for anyone who owns their home uh, and or investments in Brisbane or is thinking about making that. I think you can uh, you know, do it with a bit of confidence going forward. Wow, amazing. So if you do have a place in a city, um, yeah, now's the time to think about what to do about it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. buy more. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you've got one near the other, you reckon? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My tiny flat might be worth something. Um, so any questions from the audience here or anyone on Zoom, you can also type that in the chat function. So anyone here in the audience got a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about compound um, learnings, I guess. I guess what is you, what is your thing that, that you do weekly to educate yourself? Or keep right. You up to, yeah. So the question was, we're talking about compound learnings, and what do I do every single week to grow, to compound grow? Um, habits, you know, habits. You, you, your habits define you, really. I think sixty percent of all decisions that we make every single day is a habit. It's an automatic um, sequence that we're just programmed into. Uh, so I'm always trying to maintain healthy habits. Um, my partner, Han, uh, she, she and I have this uh, uh, compromise, we'll call it, on waking up early. I, I try and wake up and go to bed at the same time every single day where, where I can uh, because I think sleep's super important. And uh, for five or six years um, before Han moved in with me and we were, we were dating and she was living in Melbourne and I was in Brisbane, <laughs> We, uh, I would wake up at 4.45 every single morning. Uh, and, the, and the reason for doing that is I reckon it gave me an hour, maybe even two, head start on everyone else. I was in a job where I didn't have experience, so I felt like I needed that extra hour or two that would compound every single week. And um, that's, you know, five hours a week, um, 250 hours in, in a year, over, over however many years it compounds. So for me, getting up and maintaining that is really important. Hannah moved up and she said, well, I wake up at 5.25 and you waking up at 4.45 is inconvenient because I, I, can, I can't get back to sleep. So it's now 5.05. Um, but every single day, 5.05, wake up. And then always trying to build new habits. Um, we have, you know, productive and unproductive habits. Um, you can't get rid of a bad habit. That's scientifically proven. You've got to replace it with another habit. And a habit has three parts to it. It has a trigger, it has a routine, and it has a reward. So I'm constantly trying to trick myself into getting rid of bad habits. Um, you know, and, and, and one such reason might be to wake up and exercise. The trigger has to be the alarm. And I know I never do it in the afternoon, so I'm gonna get it done first thing in the morning. The alarm goes off, that's my trigger. I've got all my uh, running gear laid out next to the bed and I know I've just got to get into that gear as soon as I can. Then I've got to get my way downstairs. Then I've got to do my run. But then I've also got to reward myself at the end. Otherwise, I'm not going to get addicted to it. 
So we actually, we're very addictive creatures. That's how we form habits. So we've got to actually create an addiction. And the addiction for me is uploading it to my app and showing all my friends that I did the run uh, and treating myself to a, a coffee afterwards. So, you know, I'm constantly trying to trick myself out of bad habits and replace them with, with good habits and maintain those ones that I have. Good tip. And that's uh, in the book too. Any, um, there's a lot of information around about the um, benefits of investing in regional real estate. Um, at the moment, I've lived in regional Australia for half my life and did not have that experience. And I'm yeah. wondering if you have a view on that. Um, look, I've I've not been taught to make money out of property in regional uh, markets. Uh, the reason being is that they're quite volatile. And for me, you know, uh, number one, I think if you're going to build a portfolio of properties, which is what you need if you're going to get the compound growth and really see the, the, the big benefits, you need stability. And so I like capital city properties because they typically go up and then flatline and then up and then flatline. Whereas the regional areas can be up and down. Uh, and the reason for that is that the population goes up and down. Uh, and the reason for that is that the jobs go up and down. So what, what you've got with regional areas is you don't have as many jobs as diverse an employment industry. So it means that you're susceptible to the ups and downs. Um, in recent times, I think regional, in the last, call it since COVID, regional has been the flavour of the month. Uh, and I get that and I think a lot of people would have made good money out of the regions. Uh, I don't see it as being a 10-year thing, 20-year thing for me. Um, so I, I tend to not go there. And I don't think working from home is going to be a permanent thing. I think it might have a permanent part in the way that we work, but I think we're ultimately going to have to be within some proximity to our place of work. And those places of work are in the capital cities. So I, I see cities as just being a safer bet. Having said that, though, I, there might be people who have made a lot of money out of regional areas. I haven't sort of met them or been exposed to it, so I can't can't say one way or the other. You mentioned the Richards Plan in Babylon. Apart from your own book, of course, seeing as we're at avid reader, what other books do you recommend to would-be investors? Yeah, so uh, so as well as Richards Men in Babylon, for those listening, not sure if you can hear that, uh, as well as Richards Men in Babylon, what other books do I recommend? Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it teaches you how to see debt uh, other than just a four-letter word. You know, there's good debt and there's bad debt and understanding the difference between that. Uh, that's a classic. I think that was written in the 90s, 1990s. Uh, so that, that's a good one. I love, uh, there's a book called Atomic Habits, which is about building new habits, which I, I think is a fantastic book. Um, and, you know, The Barefoot Investor is a great um, Bible. You know, I think, uh, you know, the awareness that Scott Pate uh, brought about uh, for personal finance. You know, I, I think um, there's a lot of good things in there when it comes to getting control. Um, we may differ in certain views on, on where you take it from the point where you've got control. Um, but, you know, there's a reason that a lot of people carry around little orange cards. Um, he clearly <laughs> has a bit of cut through and relatability and, and, and helps to trigger that getting control component, which, which I think is quite critical. So that'd be a few to get you started. And we have all of those books, I think. And, <laughs> and we also have... Um, uh, the Seven Steps to Wealth. And Seven Steps to Wealth, sorry. I should, have, I should have said, John, John will be filthy. Well, the Australian, <laughs> the, the Australian did pick up my article and they uh, and they, they took an excerpt, excerpt of the book and had John Fitzgerald as the uh, the author and gave him all the credit. So, right. John, if you're listening at home, I'm saying that's a little bit of payback. But, uh, but yeah, John, John has a book called Seven Steps to Wealth. It's very different to my book. In fact, I, I consciously set out to write a book that some people would, you know, for the people that might even be intimidated by Seven Steps to Wealth, you know, a book about building wealth, I thought, well, maybe there's people that are even intimidated by the concept of that. So uh, Bulletproof Investing, Gaining Financial Control in Uncertain Times, I really wanted it to be a book that people could say, yeah, who doesn't want financial control in uncertain times, let alone the most uncertain period that we've had in recent history? sign me up uh, and, and, and I will say just to, to, to round that out my youngest reader so far you asked before and I should have mentioned how early do you get started my youngest reader so far is 13 my oldest reader is 73 
so far. And what I've loved is I'm getting one or two messages uh, every day or two uh, from people. And, and what I'm loving is that so many people are saying to me, it felt like you were just having a conversation. And uh, they follow that up with saying, I'm someone who doesn't read a lot or I never read. And that to me is like the greatest compliment anyone could ever give me that I've been able to reach someone that doesn't typically read. Um, that might also mean that the vocabulary isn't that strong, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm taking it as a compliment nonetheless. <laughs> It's certainly a compliment. I think we really <laughs> encourage people who just start somewhere and uh, particularly with um, finance books are very intimidating mm. as yeah. someone who really can't even count up how many people we've got on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I think it's really important that we've got a book that's um, that's easy to access. Um, now, I think there's one more question on Zoom. So I'll do that one first. Um, actually, there's two. So Sean um, has said, read the book, loved it. Um, do you have any concerns about struggling to find tenants for your rentals during the long-term border closures and lack of people moving to Australia? That is an issue at the moment, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's more pronounced with units. Uh, and the reason for that is that we don't have students coming into Australia anymore. And, and, and I think that we should you know, try and get students back. I, I've, I've never quite understood the rationale on that. Putting that aside, um, you know, I guess it comes down to the research. I always look for areas that are, you know, fast growing from a population point of view. Now today I might have more of a bias on interstate migration because there's not as much overseas migration. Um, but I do also think that there's a bit of a tree change going on at the moment where people are wanting the suburban um, home. So I sort of see those areas as a really safe bet today. And then from there, I just drill down and do my research make sure that I'm going into an area that doesn't have a high vacancy rate and always try and have, um, you can do the research on it, where you try and make sure that your rent is less than 30% of what the average uh, household income is in a given year, because that's gonna mean that it's affordable. And if you've got affordable rental accommodation, it's the safest uh, section of the market, you know. It was once explained to me by a client of John's uh, who'd been going for some years. That my view is that when the market crashes, the people in the million dollar homes downgrade to the $800,000 homes. The people in the $800,000 homes downgrade to the 500. The people in the 500 rent the 500. So it's the safest section of the market. And I've always, that's always stuck with me as that sort of de-risking um, component when it does come to finding tenants and ensuring you've got rental income coming in. There's one more Zoom question that I'll ask, um, and then if there's one more audience question from real life. Um, this is from Bridget. What advice would you give people who have commissioned... Uh, what advice would you give people um, who have commission or bonuses as part of their pay and therefore their net pay changes up to up? Put extra savings or accounts for savings targets? Yeah, so I'll say that there's maybe two prongs to that. If you're investing, it's really important that you've got three months buffer. That's three months of buffer. Um, and, and I really, really make sure that I, I make some sacrifices in the short term if I need to and go without things to try and get that buffer. Or if I lose it, I make sacrifices to try and build it back up again. Uh, I think, depending on how big a proportion you're um, your bonus is as a percentage of your overall income. I always encourage anyone who earns commission to try and live off their base. Let's try and make sure that we build you a budget and you can go by the way to, the, to my website. There's a free budget tool, a free habits tool and a free uh, goal setting tool. And the budget tool there, put in your income as your base salary. And then from there, work out your 10% savings and live off the rest so that your commission is a bonus and it's going to enable you to save even more money. Uh, I set that as maybe a little bit of a challenge for people. I started doing that when, you know, I got into my mid-20s, um, you know, 20% of my wage started to become my commission and I still drew out the 200 bucks even though I started earning more money. I still rented a place uh, for the same rent even though I was now able to earn commissions 
so that that for me was just being a little bit of a little bit more disciplined. Um, uh, but you know, there may be other ways. That sounded very smart. I had no idea what you said, but oh, I you have to read the book if you if you're on my level to get any of that. Um, is there one more question from people in the room before we go to signing? No. Well, I'll go yeah. ahead. Yeah. I, I probably got double your your financial experience in yes. terms of time. I've probably got half your net worth. <laughs> so one of the two lessons that I don't know, I hope you've covered them in the in the book. What if I was talking to you or to any young person here, what would I say I would do differently? One, I would do what uh, what's the name? Well, Melissa Gates said, the most important decision in your life is who you get into bed with, right? Mm -hmm. Who you marry, right? Yep. Two years later, after saying it, she's divorced. <laughs> Divorcing, so take that or leave it. But but that if you two are in a good relationship where you support each other and you're investing, then I congratulate you and commend you. The other thing I would do if I had my time again is I would not get into this shares versus property thing, which is constantly pushed at us all the time. I have to say, what net worth, 90% of what net worth I have has been from property, right? So what I'm saying is if I had my time again, I wouldn't get into this shares versus, it's not an either or, if you're smart enough to do it, do both. Okay, yep. So uh, I'm not sure if everyone heard that, but you know, what, what, what would be, yeah, the mistakes in hindsight was picking the right person to share your bed with, apparently. And, uh, <laughs> Melinda Gates did quite well out of it. I only got married three months ago. You could have that. I'll take it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the second one was to, uh, you know, have an each way better, I guess, a bit of property and a bit of shares. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think the biggest mistake, um, you know, just to add to that, I think the biggest mistake that I see people make with the benefit of hindsight is not having a long-term view. You know, you've got to have a long-term view. If you expect it to happen in any less than 10 years, it's destined to fail. Unfortunately, and you might not want to hear that, but you know, 10 years is, uh, is you know, and getting there is better than, than 20 years and not. So, you know, having that long-term view and being really patient and disciplined is important. You know, and when, when it comes to property, most property investors, they sell their property within five or six years. And the average property cycle takes 10. So that, that's sort of, you know, that long-term perspective going in. And I'm sure it's the same with shares. Um, I don't know shares, but, you know, I think if you do anything from an investment point of view, go in with a long-term perspective and attitude. Very good advice to end on, I think. Um, and from a writer married to another writer, I think you're probably <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> you might make different choices if you want some money in life. Um, but it has, so I'm, I'm glad you're giving all your profits from the book because, you know, I, Thank it's, you. It's, it's a fantastic thing to do. Um, Georgie, that was a really great conversation. Thank you. Um, it was really fantastic. And yeah, thanks, um, Georgie. This you speak very well. <laughs> <laughs> James, this sounds like an amazing um, book for someone who really is entry level as well. So it's really fantastic to have that there to sell to people for now. So everyone, let's um, congratulate James. On the Thanks for having me. And anyone who is listening at home, you've got to come and check uh, Avid Reader out in West End. They've got like wine and everything going on. <laughs> you know, this beautiful out, outdoor courtyard set up. Uh, get online and check them out. I know I'll, I'll certainly uh, be trying to come back uh, and I'll probably treat myself to a wine after this. Excellent. We will do that. <laughs> Thanks we'll for treat me. you to one as we take you to your table. So um, we're going to take um, James out to the table first so that he can sign books. Um, do remember your masks. If you've taken them off, we're going to have to put them on to go through the thing. So we'll um, we'll get you to come through first. Have you got a mask with you? I do. You do. Excellent. Excellent. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Th